I feel like I'm on the news. Yeah, that's... It's not picking it up. It is. See? And it transcribes it as you talk. Oh, that's very nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. $30 a month. That's what that'll Jesus. get you. Okay. I guess there are good ways to spend your money. <laughs> yeah. Welcome back to Nothing About Something. I am your host, Lauren, and today I have with me my dad. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm dad. Thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. This is exciting. Yeah. So hopefully the turnaround time is quick. We're filming on the 7th and we're going to release the episode on the 8th. So hopefully it turns out good. You got a lot of work to do. I do. I do. And it's eight o'clock at night. All right. Today's episode, I might call it the high life. We're going to talk about flying, drinking and living life. (laughs) So you've done a lot of cool stuff and I think... All the cool stuff that you've done, a lot of people want to know about. I guess it's cool stuff. It's a job. I've been all over the world. Had a good time doing that. And I guess had some pretty interesting times. All right. I guess a lot of people would think it's pretty cool. Yeah, I think so. All right, let's dive in. So the first thing that I really want to touch on is what exactly did you do as a career? What did I do as a career? I've been a pilot for the majority of my career. So flying airplanes, I guess, is the answer to that question. But there's a lot more to my career than just flying airplanes. Military pilot, one of the the biggest things about that job is you don't really get to fly all the time, depending on what airplane you fly. So... There are always what they affectionately refer to as extra duties, things that you have to do when you're not flying, and those take up a lot of your time. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of those times, but there's a lot of flying too. Yeah. So I think many people are going to think that being an Air Force pilot and being a commercial pilot are pretty much the same thing. Right off the top of your head, can you explain how those two careers are different? They are different, but they are Pretty much the same in many aspects. Commercial aviation, corporate aviation is very similar to a lot of the jobs that military pilots do. We have airlifters, we have tankers that refuel other airplanes. So that would be kind of analogous to an airline pilot. Obviously, in the civilian world, we don't really have uh, bomber pilots or fighter pilots and that sort of thing. So those avenues are a little bit different. But in general, the skills that it takes on a day-to-day basis are very similar, and they're pretty much interchangeable. The military does have some unique missions that require some additional skills and additional training. So Mm -hmm. that is probably one of the biggest differences is the different types of missions that military pilots experience versus the civilian pilots. Hmm. Out of all the airplanes that you've flown, are you allowed to tell me which one your favorite plane was? I've had... Quite a few airplanes that I've flown, and I would have to say that probably my all-time favorite was the Gulfstream, although I flew C-5s, which is a large airlifter. So those two are probably right up there as the, the favorite military airplanes that I've flown. However, I was an instructor pilot early on, and that w- I flew a T-37, which is a side-by-side training jet, And that was probably the most fun and most rewarding job that I had in aviation because I got to train up-and-coming pilots a skill that they didn't have Mm -hmm. prior to that. So two airplanes, the Gulfstream and the uh, C-5 are probably the most favorite, but the most fun was probably the T-37. So you've gone from planes that could pretty much fit inside of a room to giant cargo planes, I guess, just to kind of give people a perspective on size. Yeah, absolutely. So the T-37 is the Air Force's was. They've retired it probably, oh, 15 years ago now. It's been replaced by another airplane, a T-6, if you're familiar with those. But the T-37 was the smallest airplane in the Air Force inventory. And I went from flying the T-37 to the largest airplane in the inventory of the C-5. So that was quite a a change but again good training we had good sim instructors we had good simulators and a lot of time in the airplane so it was a, 
a fairly easy transition, believe it or not. So all the airplanes that you've flown, at least from what you talked about growing up, they all had nicknames. Like the T-37 was the tweet and Correct. C-5 was Freddy. Do civilian airplanes have their nicknames or the big planes that take people like on Southwest or any of those? They do, but they're not as common. So you're not going to say I'm going to take on... Freddy into the sky if you're flying a commercial. Not really. They normally just go by their manufacturer names. Gotcha. But there are still some out there. There's a Cessna Citation, which is a, a very successful business jet, but it's slow. So a lot of people call it the slotation for all the yeah. Citation pilots out there. But yeah, there are nicknames for airplanes. Yeah. And so kind of shifting gears a little bit, what was it like to travel for a living? I know you mentioned that it wasn't always traveling. You had a lot of extra duties that you had to do, but when you were going from place to place and you were spending a lot of time overseas, how was that like to not be able to be home all the time? That is part of the perks of the job, and that's part of the downside of the job is when you fly airplanes for a living, you have to expect to be gone. So There was a lot of time away from home in the military. Civilian pilots experienced the same thing, maybe not quite as long of periods of time at one time for the civilian world. But yeah, one of the biggest things is you're going to spend many nights away from home. And so having a small family when you guys were all young, that was more difficult. The older you got, that became more easy. But being on a crewed airplane, having sometimes 14 to 16 crew members traveling around the world in the c5 was a blast we went all over the place all kinds of parties you made the best of it long days back after 9 11 we were actually flying we could have a 26 hour day was our limit which obviously wow. doesn't make any sense 24 hours <laughs> a day so we could theoretically operate for 26 hours before we had to go to bed and we did it regularly so wow. that was that was a challenge at times but it's a big airplane places to sleep and a lot of crew members made that happen talk about jet lag and going from time zone to time zone absolutely yeah no wonder you can't sleep nowadays <laughs> no i take naps all the time so it's got lasting effects but i did really want to hone in on the fun parts of the air force and the fun parts of the traveling today we're going to touch on a few things i want to go kind of into the food and the unique foods that you got to try all the way to drinks and go from there probably the biggest thing i think i want to know at least is what are some of the most unique foods you've tried you've been to so many places we were talking you've been to pretty much everywhere but antarctica and australia antarctica australia to the continents that i haven't been to yeah so i'm sure you've tried a lot of and antarctica is not a continent but oh what is it it's the southern pole it's a melting ice cap i guess these days (laughs) aren't there seven continents though there are seven continents isn't that one of the seven? Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> and Alaska is We might below. have to edit that out. <laughs> Where's the map? It's okay. <laughs> Pull it up. I, I thought Alaska was below us for many years. So. It is on the map. Yeah. Yeah. That, so it's a reasonable <laughs> assumption. But out of all of those places, do you have anything that really sticks out in particular on the best thing you've ever tried or the most expensive thing you've ever tried or anything that really stands out to you? Most expensive? Not really. Some of the best things. I always grew up in Texas eating Mexican food, so Spanish food, they're not similar at all. They do have some similarities, but Spanish food was always good. Paella, which is a rice and shrimp seafood dish, is mm. is pretty good. That's one of my favorites. German food is always a big hit. Every time we went to Germany, we love the food and the beer there. Is it like pretzels, like um, you would see? Yeah, they do have pretzels. But you always so my take on German food is schnitzel like you beat the absolutely schnitzel. That's the word I was looking for. (laughs) Chicken schnitzel, pork schnitzel, Jaeger style. So does it taste different there than what it does here? Of course. They have German restaurants here and they do a pretty good job. But I think part of the the fun part of traveling is when you're in a place getting to experience the people and the food it does taste different because they have different techniques and they have their local produce and their their experience in cooking and their family and the way that they make things is just i guess it makes it taste better in some cases 
So in my head, I think, okay, you're going to go to a different country and you're going to sit down and enjoy a meal at the res- at a restaurant. Is that always the case? Or are, were there times where you would go and is it more street vendors in some places? Or are you going to, I don't know, distant villages? Like I know you've been to Peru. So is it always just restaurants where you go? There are restaurants all over the world that are very similar to the restaurants here in the United States. They have street vendors in many countries that are very popular. Food trucks have become popular in the United States over the last 20 years and very similar to the street vendors in different countries. If you go to New York City, they have the street vendors Mm -hmm. for hot dogs and that sort of thing. So it's similar to that around the world. Some of the best street food, probably again, Germany, we would get Donner kebabs, which is really a a gyro or a hero Hmm. sandwich. The same thing. Those were really good. And again, they're made out of the same thing, but they just taste different because you're overseas. Yeah, that's really cool. I think you've had so many different food experiences that most people don't get the opportunity to get. But I think part of that is because you're so open-minded and you're willing to try all different kinds of foods. But what about the really picky people? Did you ever fly with anybody that refused to eat? Oh, absolutely. I still fly with people that (laughs) are fairly picky and won't eat their vegetables and that sort of thing. But yeah, we, that was a common thing. There were not A lot, but there were people that just wouldn't try the local cuisine. Flew with one guy that just wouldn't eat anything other than Burger King. And he knew the Burger Kings all over the world. A lot of military bases have Burger Kings around the world, so he was able to get his Burger King (laughs) fix. But, yeah, he went hungry, I guess. He had sandwiches or whatever if there wasn't a Burger King. But I was a picky child whenever I was growing up, didn't like seafood. But I decided you're in these places, they're there to experience their culture and what better way than to sample some of their food. You have to get over some aversions, not big on eating bugs or that sort of thing. But yeah, you have to look at it. It looks a little different than what we have, but most of the time, I'm not disappointed when you try things. So you have ate several bugs. I know you said you've ate ants before. Definitely ants. And you've ate other bugs (laughs) <laughs> Not that I can remember. I try to stay away from the bugs. What do ants taste like? They actually taste like oranges, the citrusy flavor. So not the, like, little sugar ants. I guess they were sugar ants. They probably weren't fire ants. That would be kind of yeah. painful. But, yeah, I think they were probably sugar ants. They're a little bit larger, small sugar ants you see around here. But I guess if you had to survive, you could eat a ton of them. The Burger King guy would not live. No, I don't think he probably <laughs> ate many of the ants. I guess. Remember the time that we went to Burger King way back when? It's when we were you were stationed in Texas the first time around, I guess. We went to Burger King after I went and got shots on base, and we had the most disgusting burger and the most disgusting lemonade, and swore we would never Actually, go back. that was in Maryland. Oh, it was? That was in Maryland, yes. And the, the Black Widow, I think was her name, the lady that was the hot dog eating champion for many years ago, probably 2008 or so when she first got that award, maybe even earlier, I'm not sure. But I think she actually worked at that Burger King. No way. Yeah. Oh, wow. But yes, I remember that. You didn't go back to Burger King ever, I think. Uh Uh-uh. I haven't Uh -uh. been back since then. The crowns were really cool and the cinnamon rolls were good. But after that, I think it was a no-go for me. Yeah, that was a bad day. I don't think they changed the grease. Yeah. So do you think if somebody went to a foreign country and absolutely refused to eat any of the food there, do you think they would miss out on a big part of the culture of that place? Well, sure. And depending on how long they stay, I'm not sure what they're going to eat. Yeah. (laughs) It's a small world and you can get normal food wherever you Mm go. But yeah, one of the, like I said, one of the biggest experiences in traveling is being able to communicate with people. You might not always speak their language, but eating their food, trying different things. You could always kind of understand what people are talking about. And yeah, they people that don't experience and spread their wings a little bit probably do miss out a lot. So mm-hmm. I would highly suggest if you're out there traveling, push your envelope, pick up something that doesn't look appetizing and mm-hmm. try it. See, you may like it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I guess my last question about this is ordering food. Do you sometimes whenever I go somewhere, I don't want to pronounce something wrong. So I'll just point at the menu and say, I want that and kind of laugh nervously. But is that something in foreign countries, you're going to try to at least say what you want, and you're going to try and communicate to them in your language? Or 
how does just ordering food in general? Well, work? most Americans probably think that everybody speaks English, which obviously the world doesn't only. Uh, no. We don't speak English all over the world. So, yeah, Asia rings a bell from there are a lot of different cuisines there, a lot of different things that you probably don't even know what they are. But I remember we used to call them pointy talkies. And basically, you see a lot of the menus around in the States now that have pictures. And you go, I went this <laughs> here. And you're, of course, speaking louder and you're trying to have an accent to blend in, but they don't care. You're dumb. But <laughs> so the pointy yeah. talkie, that's the best way to, to order. That's and again, funny. you really never know what you're going to get. Yeah. Cause I remember being in Italy one time, in Sicily, Italy. And looking at the menu, all Italian, and I knew it was pizza, and there were probably six or seven different pizzas, and I went, well, it's the number one, it's the most expensive, so I'll have that one. <laughs> and I got it, and it was a pretty good pizza, actually, but the thing that I didn't expect is it had scrambled eggs on it, so uh -huh. that was quite unique. It was a normal pizza, other than the scrambled eggs. That's cool. Yeah, it was different. What's the weirdest thing you've tried? I think I'm not a huge sushi fan. I have to be in the mood for sushi. But eating sushi in Japan was probably the weirdest experience. They had the little sushi boats going around and just knowing what it was. But I wanted to try it, and I did. It wasn't my favorite dish. What do you mean what it was? I eat sushi well, all the time. Well, it's fish, but you don't know exactly what kind of fish uh, or whatever else. What's so this green stuff? Probably seaweed. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. But that was a unique experience. I wanted to try a little peer pressure. All the other people were eating. I'm like, I'm going to try this. And it wasn't bad. little texture difference with some raw fish has a different consistency than you I think eat you should sushi. be eating. Right. Good. That was my first I'll... experience, so it was yeah. weird. And honestly... Still today, I have to be in the mood to have sushi. I'll do it, but it's different, and it is tasty. So, again, broaden your horizons. Every Wednesday at our HEB, this is, which is the Texas grocery store, they have a sushi sale. And so all their sushi <laughs> goes on sales on Wednesday, typically what I eat for lunch on Wednesday. Gotta have the sushi sample. <laughs> yeah, but it's not as good. It is not as good as any. I've been to some pretty good, I guess, more or less real sushi restaurants, and you can tell a huge difference. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I imagine Japan would be a lot better. But you've never had like eyeballs or snake or... No, I think I'd have to be really hungry to eat eyeballs. You've ate frog though, right? Yeah, I've had frog legs. That's a little different though. It's not an eye. Snakes? Never had snake. Really? Nope. Huh. Stay away from that. Again, if you're yeah. hungry, if you're starving, maybe yeah. all right, but I'll stay away from that. Yeah, I would not. <laughs> I think I'd rather go hungry. But I, I do want to touch on one of the more hot button topics before we move away from food. So this is something that a lot of people on TikTok and these modern social media platforms are really trying to raise awareness for. And it is the color additives in food. I, I don't know for sure, but I think Lucky Charms, not throwing anybody under the bus, but cereals, typically candies, sodas have the, this coloring in it to make it look more appetizing. And so there's some big safety concerns regarding these dyes, especially in the relation to hyperactivity in children, which we've seen a lot of ADHD and kids pop up, potential cancer risks. So those are some concerns. And the FDA has approved all of it. They've said, you know what, it's good to go in U.S. foods. There's enough or not enough to kill you in it and not enough to cause any harmful I guess, damage to you. But then you look at other countries and they've completely banned it. So what is your opinion on other countries and them handling just food laws? It seems like the U.S. is a little bit more lax. I don't know if the U.S. is more lax. I think we're certainly a country of laws and rules and Obviously, the FDA is a pretty strong entity, and under the guise of food safety, they, I think, try to make the best, most informed decisions. That may not always be the, the best thing. Obviously, they're trying to keep us safe, but with modified foods and that sort of thing that are popular these days in order to increase yields and be able to grow a lot more food and have a lot higher production rates on foods they have to do some of these things or there's a perception that they have to do these things is it good i don't know is it bad maybe but there's a popular 
chain out there with a, a pretty good name, Whole Foods, and not anything special about them because you can go to any grocery store and get that. And if you pretty much shop with fresh foods, fruits and vegetables, and around the perimeter of the grocery store, as they say, you can kind of stay away from a lot of the, the dyes and the artificial ingredients. So that's always been my take. That's pretty much where I spend the yeah. most majority of my time in the grocery store other than on the beer aisle (laughs) (laughs) yeah do you think that other countries i don't want to say care more about our safety but do you think other countries put less additives in their food do you think their food is i guess more natural more organic and we're more of a processed food country or do you think everybody's kind of following suit with the processed foods trend i would think that probably the majority of the world is we're becoming a smaller world all the time with air travel and that sort of thing you can get fresh flowers from italy for crying out loud and be in the states overnight so we are becoming a smaller world so i think a lot of the techniques and procedures that we use here in this in the states probably they do the same elsewhere although i know a lot of people in this country have celiac disease that and they can't have glutens and that sort of thing and that's been a thing for a while now and occasionally you'll hear uh, well a lot of menus have gluten-free items and some people are uh, deathly ill whenever they encounter glutens so i guess one example that i know of is they don't seem to have the same issues in italy for instance with their glutens and they have flour and they use flour products and their pizzas and their breads and everything and their pastas so why is it different there i don't know or maybe our food production with the modifications that we've done to the foods in this country i don't really know the answer to that but i do know that people not don't seem to have those issues in a country like italy is it a production is it a business issue i don't really know the answer to that yeah. Shifting gears just a little bit, um, still want to kind of touch on the food topic. I think that you've learned a lot of valuable skills from traveling around and that's sure. transferred into your cooking because you've always cooked really good things, which I just cannot seem to top at all. I The best that I can do is the preseason meats at HEB and those taste pretty darn good. Uh, Processed. So, yeah, <laughs> exactly. When did you discover that you first like cooking? I guess I was a small child, probably seven or eight. I grew up in a large family and my father cooked barbecue all the time. We had family gatherings and aunts and uncles would come over, brothers and sisters would come over and just cousins. And it was always a big party and somebody was always making something, whether it's cakes or barbecue or sides, whatever. Somebody was always in the kitchen making something or bringing something over and everybody in my family loved to eat and of course part of that was you have to learn to cook if you're going to eat so I think one of the first things that I remember cooking was I like to make my own barbecue sauce and I really didn't make my own I just modified the Kraft or Heinz barbecue sauce that they used to have by putting Dr. Pepper in it and I would cook it down it was always a hit. Everybody liked the Dr. Pepper barbecue sauce. And in fact, now you can go to some grocery stores and you can find barbecue sauce with Dr. Pepper in it. So maybe I was cutting edge. You could have you been know, a millionaire. I, I know. Some of my family must have stole it. But So that's the first thing. But then we used to make candy as well. I used to remember making really? uh, peanut brittle was always fun. And then pecan pralines was always a fun thing to make. So I think that's really what got me into cooking. And then by design in college, not really having a lot of money, learning to make mac and cheese kind of perfected that a little bit. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Do you think that traveling helped you to learn new cooking techniques? And I know that you've taken some cooking classes abroad, right? Sure. Actually, I have. I had a trip not too many years ago in Rome, Italy, and got to fortunate enough to have some time off and was able to take an all-day cooking class had a lot of wine with the the cooking class (laughs) with my flight attendant and we had a great time people from all over the world in that class there were probably 15 people maybe 16 total um, people from korea americans Uh, there were some south african people in the class it was just a, a great time and we got to learn to make authentic pasta i don't think i could replicate it today but it was a good time and we had a great meal after we everybody cooked for three or four hours They had some chefs in the back that were obviously helping, but then we got to eat the meal. 
that we yeah. all had a hand in preparing, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah. You've always done cool stuff. For dinner, you had Asian lettuce wraps, right? I did. Yeah. Well, that was your mother's idea. She oh. had that the other day when I was on the road, so I came home to that. Okay. So okay. we had some leftovers. So she's learning, too. You're, you're she is. Transitioning. I, I remember as a kid, we had our go-to meals. It was like a tuna pasta. I don't know what oh, that's yeah. called. Haven't had that in a while. Yeah. Yeah. We'd have that. Uh, we'd have King Ranch casserole. And I think we have some of that in the fridge too. Yeah. And <laughs> mac and cheese. I think those were our big hits, but I know whenever you'd come home, she was always a good cook. She always tried, but it was always exciting when you would come home and make something because it was always different and it was always good. And <laughs> now I go through the aisles of H-E-B and I wander and I never can find anything, so I just go back to the basics, the yeah. chicken and the rice. We always kind of, everybody has their habits, and I do the same thing, so it's kind of hard to break out. But the Internet's great for that. You can find any recipe if you think something popped into my head yesterday. Oh, peanut Thai noodles, that sounds kind of good. And sure enough, within about 30 seconds, oh, here's a Thai peanut noodle sauce. So yeah. we whip that up, and it's pretty good. Yeah. That is cool. Have you ever cooked with anything really unconventional? Like in those cooking shows, they say, you can make anything you want, but you have to use ketchup or some just really off ingredient. Have you ever tried to take on cooking with something completely new or having to butcher something before you cook it? Or Yeah, I've had to butcher something before I cook it. Survival training. I've had to kill some chickens, of course, <laughs> growing up in Texas. Sometimes you got to kill it before you grill it, I think was Ted Nugent's. I don't know, a lot of you young guys don't maybe know who Ted Nugent was, but that was one of his favorite quotes. you got to kill it before you grill it, which means you got to clean it before you cook it as well. So, How did you kill a chicken you without... What did you hang them upside down and let their the blood go to the head and then you cut their heads off? But you had to catch it. Well, they, uh, they weren't that hard to catch. Oh, so you just they, ran. They weren't wild chickens or anything. Oh, okay. I, I thought survival training, then you might have had to run after the well, chicken. We, and... No, it wasn't. In survival training, it was rabbits. We had to kill and eat the rabbits. What did you kill it with? Because I'm sure you're not given weapons, so. A stick. Oh, <laughs> you killed a bunny with a stick. All the PETA people are going to... Oh, yeah, they're going to love that. But, hey, you, know, you got to eat. You got to eat. Was rabbit good? It was burnt by the time we got finished cooking it. Yeah. That was okay, other than it was burnt. But so you... that was actually a technique for people that are averse to different foods like rabbits. If you burn it, it all tastes the same. Oh, that's true. But it would probably give you cancer, so I don't know if I'd recommend that. <laughs> So you had help killing the... No, just one. I killed the rabbit. No, you had help doing it or you did it by yourself? I did it by myself. Hmm. Because one of these fighter pilot types didn't want to do it. I was elected (laughs) in to kill the rabbit because I had it was the highest rank, apparently. So the airman made me... Oh my gosh. So you're going to start a fight between the (laughs) fighters and the heavies on who's more macho. That's funny. Wow. Okay, so that's pretty cool. I was surprised. That you killed the rabbit? No, that oh. he didn't want to kill the rabbit. <laughs> Big F-16 guy. That's, All right. That's funny. I didn't know you killed a bunny. In, in, well, I don't think of it as a bunny, but it was a rabbit. same thing. It wasn't like buns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like my bunny. Mm. She, this was a ragged-looking, skinny thing. That's cool. What'd you do with the eyes? Actually, I think somebody did egg the eyes, not me. <laughs> I don't remember who it was, but yeah, somebody did. Okay. Can't let it go to waste. Yeah, yeah. No, they do say that whenever you're talking about oh, hunting yeah. and stuff. Yeah, there were some instructors that I remember one of the kids that I was in college with, I don't remember his name, but was killing some worms, and the instructor made him eat them. See, if you're going to kill it, you're going to eat it. So that was mm. my lesson. I'm not going to kill it unless I'm prepared to eat it. So Yeah, yeah, I guess that's good. So I, I guess rabbit is pretty unconventional. Ants are pretty interesting. You've ate scorpions, right? I had the one of the lollipops that had a scorpion oh. in it. So I don't think I got all the way to the scorpion. Oh, that's <laughs> weird. All right. So I wrote down if you've ever had any kind of cooking disaster or, or anything's ever gone really wrong. Just 
maybe cooking or just in general on any of your trips? Is there anything fun or interesting? Anybody going to any medical emergencies or any? I don't think I've had really any cooking emergencies. Knock on wood. That's good. Yeah. I haven't caught anything on fire or anything like that. But I did narrowly avert, I think, food poisoning. We were in Spain and my crew was out eating and one of the flight attendants had a shrimp dish and I had a different shrimp dish but from the same restaurant and mine was pretty good so I pretty much ate all of my shrimp she wanted to share hers with me and I was fortunately I was full and didn't really feel like I needed to take her shrimp at the time so I didn't and fortunately I did that because the next day she ended up with food poisoning mm. and uh, she was incapacitated fortunately she had a student that was flying with her so we loaded her up with Imodium AD and tucked her up in some blankets on the couch. And we flew to Africa with her and pumped her up with Imodium AD for the next couple of days. And we were there for several days and she got better and off we went. But yeah, that was that would have been a disaster. Africa's cool. I mean, Africa was pretty cool, but not whenever you have food poisoning. Yeah. I'm sure she was. I know she was miserable for the, the flight down and then the first day or two while we were there. But she got better. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, I've been to several parts of Africa. In fact, Djibouti, it's the name of the town and the country, so the city and the country, and I just like saying it, Djibouti. But <laughs> I remember sitting out in front of my airplane there, I was on the C5, and all of a sudden, I guess it was quitting time, this just mass of people came walking out from across the fence line through all the airplanes, and there were probably hundreds, several hundreds of people and they just made a wave pass through the airplane didn't bother anything and they just kept on going to the other side of the airfield so mm. i think it was just their commute their work day was over and the easiest way to get home was across the airfield so it didn't surprise huh. anybody other than the people that were on my crew like well, what's going on here huh. so but as far as tribes not really i didn't get out in the bush or anything yeah so you're not <laughs> landing on u.s territory all the time or for the most part you are no, it depends. Flying around the world, a lot of times we land on U.S. military bases down in Cuba. Guantanamo Bay is a perfect example of that. It is on the island of Cuba, but we have a naval base down there, which is technically U.S. property. It belongs yeah. it's on the island of Cuba, but the U.S. owns it and maintains it. So, yes, we have bases all over the world, but you land in other countries when you're not on a base. So is there a risk of leaving the plane if you're not on a U.S. operated base? Certainly. It depends on where you're at and if there's conflict going on at that particular mm -hmm. time. Ukraine probably wouldn't be a great place to be right now as an American, well, for anybody, I guess for that matter. But yeah, certainly. If the time's a conflict, if there's uh, something going on, it's better to follow all the rules. And of course, Air Force had a lot of rules that we followed, and mainly for safety. But yeah, you, you followed the rules and you stayed safe, and we didn't really have issues with mm. that. I know this isn't really related to the travel, food, or anything, but I just am curious, can you talk just a little bit about how flying changed after 9-11? How was, how were your missions, I guess, different before and after what changed? Sure. So I remember 9-11 very vividly. You weren't very old at that point. And I remember being awakened about 5.30 in the morning California time by somebody in my squadron calling me and saying, hey, are you watching the news? They're flying airplanes into the tower. And I'm like, Don Trail, who's flying airplanes in the tower? What are you talking about? It's 5.30 in the morning. No, I'm not up. And so we obviously got up and watched history unfold. And after the second tower fell, I remember um, going upstairs and packing my bags because I knew, okay, life is going to change pretty quickly. And I did. I literally packed my bag within the first couple hours on that. And we had planes leaving. I fortunately was able to stick around for about a week and a half, two weeks before I went on my first trip. But there were planes leaving immediately taking supplies and stuff all over the world. So, yeah, it was mm. that was a big change. And then that was... <laughs> Probably four years of constantly being on the road. After Yeah, we got a lot of experience very quickly and flew all over the world. And it was a different 
environment. Not one that I expected to find myself in, but they train you for that, and that's what you do. We were all ready to go, and we did our yeah. jobs. You're always very surprisingly calm in situations that other people would not be calm. Like when your garage burnt down and I heard that you were out there with a water <laughs> hose just trying to hose down the garage that's burning into flames it until it really got too hot. hot out there. Yeah, that was hot. <laughs> that goes with training. So I think the biggest part of being a pilot is there's a lot of training. It starts from day one, and I'm not smart enough to be a doctor, but I've certainly been in enough classrooms and new airplanes and I could certainly have the classroom time to be a doctor. So there is a lot of school that goes along with it, and especially if you're like me and I've flown multiple different airplanes, learning a new airplane every couple of years adds up to a lot of coursework. But, yeah, there, it's the training, I think, is what really sets military pilots versus civilian pilots. And not that civilian pilots are any better or worse. It's very structured training in the military environment. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately for the most civilian pilots, they have to do it the hard way, starting paying for training on their own, catching uh, an instructor when they can, flying here. And there are some colleges and some flying schools that are a lot more structured than just the, the person like your uncle doing it on his own. So the structure in the military definitely makes it easier on one hand because what's going to happen tomorrow and the next day and the next day and you're getting a paycheck while you're doing it so that really helps yeah. but but across the board civilian and military pilots the training is really one of the biggest factors that goes a long way to keeping your level head and keeping you safe in the cockpit mm -hmm. we have a, an old saying that's you hack the clock and in the emergency you hack the clock and really what that means is slow things down, you analyze the situation, figure out what's going on, and then you take an appropriate action to take care of the problem. So it doesn't help to panic. I love how I am completely the opposite. <laughs> I just go straight to panic mode. Maybe you need some more training. Air Force training, yeah. I, I don't think I would fare too well in the survival training. Then uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, that's what I say. I, I told Kevin I think that they need to have a civilian one so I can try it and see how long I last. Well, you can go get on, what is the, Survivor 44, I think, was the one that I watched last week. I can't believe that. I never watched shows like that. But Oh, the ones where they are put out on an island and they have to survive? Is yeah. it the same thing? Yeah. I think so. Oh. And this was the very first episode. And I watched the whole thing. I was proud of myself. I don't know. Maybe they'll sponsor an episode if I go on. But shifting gears, I guess, to the last portion of the show, probably the portion that people are going to be the most interested in is the different alcoholic beverages they have all across the world. <laughs> I know before we started this episode, I talked about the snake tequila, but in Mexico, but it's not the snake tequila. It's completely no. the worm tequila. There's never been a snake in tequila. Uh, in I don't know if there has been a, a snake in tequila. I wouldn't put it past anybody, but that sounds more like an Asian thing, some sort of sake or something with a snake, but who Ooh. knows? No, I, I know that they have mezcal with a worm in it. Maybe that's what you're thinking, but I don't know. I thought not they, had that. Haven't I thought they it. put little snakes in it. I, they may. I don't know. I wouldn't try it. That's one of the food. There's so much other good booze out there. You don't need to drink something with a worm or a snake in it. Just saying. So you've never had the worm tequila? No. No, and... no I haven't. Mezcal or tequila. I'd probably try the one with the worm. If it was a snake, no. Yeah. But worm, maybe. Yeah, I'd try it. I'm not, I don't think I need to eat the worm. Now, if you'd finish the bottle, you might be ready oh, no. to eat the worm. I no, don't know. just one shot. So they have, they have all kinds. I know sake is really popular, especially in college town bars. They have sake bars everywhere right. where you hit the ground or you hit the table <laughs> and the chopsticks and the sake falls into it. I've had a few of those and they're always way too big of a shot for me to take by myself. But I, sake is super popular. What are some other maybe hidden gems? of just different drinks or cocktails or just liquors that you think were really good that you've tried over the years? I think every country has their own unique adult beverages, alcoholic beverages, and gosh, they run the gamut from anywhere from sitting on a, a street vendor or a restaurant in Spain having sangria that's fresh and it it's pretty amazing. Beers around the world. Indian beer is pretty good. I've had mm. some pretty decent Indian beers, African beers I've had that have been pretty tasty. Unfortunately, none of the names are ringing a bell right now. Maybe I had too many of them, but... Um, <laughs> Your memory's a little cloudy. <laughs> German beer, certainly. They're, that was always a treat to be able to go to Germany and, 
in a big airplane like a C5, we used to bring back cases of, of beer. So that you was, can bring back oh, alcohol yeah, on a yeah. military plane. Absolutely. Can you, you still can do, do that? Time. I'm sure. Yeah. Why not? That's pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. It's a good thing to fly airlifters and get cheap beer. Yeah, I was going to say it's probably a lot cheaper than what they imported into the U.S. Oh, for yeah. and just <laughs> jack the prices up big Absolutely. time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember what we used to pay. Maybe $10 for a case that probably had more than 12. Our uh, case would have 24, but the big liter bottles. Wow. Of beer for cheap. So do you think something like tequila that's traditionally made in Mexico or with that agave plant, do you think it tastes better in Mexico or do you think it's, or just because it's made there and you're getting it fresh from there, kind of like the food pretty taste. crappy tequilas made in Mexico. So I think it really doesn't matter where it's made. It's just a matter of how much you spend and you're getting the good stuff. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So... One thing about Germany, you talk about how good the drinks are, how good the food is. I think the drinking age in Germany is like 16, right? It may be fairly low. I think in Mexico it's the same thing. I don't think I think it's really 18 in Mexico. Said, yeah, I don't know. That doesn't surprise me. I think maybe they even have a different age limit for spirits versus beer in Germany. So it may be 16. I don't know. I was never 16 when I was in Germany. <laughs> yeah. So why do you think in other countries it's okay for kids that are 16 years old to drink beer, but in the United States is different? Do you think that's something that we're just behind on, or do you think it's more traditional values up there? Or There's crazy kids all over the world, I think, and in the United States. Maybe there's an idea of more of a free-for-all, and we have a lot more, maybe, maybe more access here, and... The drinking age used to be 18 whenever I was much younger. I missed it by about six months, but I had friends that were grandfathered to the drinking age when it became 21. It used to be different here. Obviously, there are reasons that they changed that law in an effort to keep people safe. Has it really? I don't know. Mm -hmm. People still get access to it. But different cultures have different ways of looking at things, and definitely Europe, uh, a lot more laid back in many ways, and I think that's probably what it comes down to. Yeah. But at the same time, you don't see, I'm, I'm going to say this and it's going to sound stupid, but maybe you don't see as many crazy drunken parties with uh, European kids. I'm sure they're out there. Maybe we just have a little bit more excess here in the States. Maybe they drink a little bit more responsibly than yes, what absolutely. U.S. Yeah, I kids think that's probably do. a better way to say it. Yeah. If you grow up around it, I know some cultures, every meal they have a drink with, I, I don't know which sure. ones it is, yeah. but I... I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I've heard things where every meal we have a drink with it and it's just normal. It's a normal Sounds thing to Italian, have a beer. Very Italian. Yeah. You have some wine with yeah. you and then some limoncello after you're done. Yeah. Have you ever, did you ever get to play any drinking games or do any fun <laughs> stuff whenever you were overseas? Oh yeah, we had all kinds of fun games that we played in the C5. Unfortunately, I don't really remember much of that. It's been a long time ago, but yeah, we didn't really play drinking games. I think we were just always so tired. We'd sit around and watch movies and drink beer and just have a good good time like that well would you do anything different would i do anything different hindsight as it is probably i would do some things different but it was a great time i learned a lot and had a wonderful experience and met a lot of great people so from that perspective i was fairly charmed i had a great career and wound up ending that career and starting a civilian career doing the same thing. All in all, it was a lot of fun, a lot of hard work at times. Some of the timing I wish was different, 9-11. Who can change that? Obviously, we wish that wouldn't have happened, but a lot of people stood up and did their duty, and so I was proud to be a part of all that, so I wouldn't change that for a minute. Yeah. I think it was, it was really cool to have you always go somewhere. I, I didn't, not seeing you, but you'd always bring back treasure every time you go somewhere. That was really cool. Yep. Llamas from South America. <laughs> yeah. The little llama teddy bear. They have some cool stuff. They do. And you've been to some cool places. I'd love to do an interview with you sometime, just kind of talking about the different cool places you've mm -hmm. been, because you've been places that people can't even dream of. Except for that continent, Antarctica. Antarctica, <laughs> yeah. And Australia. Yeah, they actually, I've heard of more and more people going to Antarctica now. It's, yeah, it's melting. You better hurry. Oh. And get there before it melts. Yeah. But you've been to Peru. You've yep. been to... That's some interesting food. Jerusalem. I never ate it, but the guinea pigs oh. in Peru. 
You didn't eat the guinea pigs? I did not eat the guinea pig. I have a picture with me and a guinea pig, but that's a street vendor food. Oh, they were probably going to butcher him. No, it was already cooked. Oh. Oh. (laughs) Oh. You just pick it up like a chicken leg. Oh. So you took a picture with the cooked (laughs) guinea pig? My friend Pedro La Riva, he introduced me to that. I'm not going to try that. Uh I'm sure it was good. One of the guys on the crew ate one. He Mm -hmm. said it tastes like chicken. Hmm. You've, we've ate alligator before. I think I've ate alligator. Yeah, I've ate alligator. Mm-hmm. That's kind of basic. Yeah, that's shark. It. You've probably had that. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever seen sharks in real life? Like yeah. on the beach? And Yeah. In fact, one of my crew members caught a baby shark when we were in Diego Garcia. That was kind of fun, watching him reel in a little shark. Oh, wow. Two foot long. Oh, wow. I guess another thing. Have you ever been to the jungle and been in the actual jungle like you see in the movies with The panthers and the monkeys. If you include the Yucatan down in Cozumel and the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, yes. But other than that, not so much. That's a tourist jungle. Oh. Where are the real jungles? (laughs) Well, South America's got jungles. Asia's got a lot of jungles. You haven't been to those? No, we stayed in the hotels. Try to stay out of the jungle. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'd love to talk to you sometime about the different places that you've been and kind of go into that. But I think the food's a good start for sure is there any final thoughts that you would have or any crazy memories that you think would be fun to share before we wrap things up geez i don't know there's so many different memories i don't know of anything in particular that's crazy it was just a fun working vacation my entire career i think the biggest thing the biggest takeaway that i had from is Try to have a good time everywhere mm-hmm. you meet or everywhere you go. Try to meet new people and just try to learn as much as you can. Yeah. Nothing yeah. too exciting, but good times. I think it's pretty exciting. Would you rather do corporate or would you rather do Air Force, which has been your favorite? There's good and bad with both. In the military, you basically get a new job every three, five years, something like that. You're moving to a new base and meeting new people. In the civilian world, people tend to stick around a little bit longer so you end up becoming more of a family-like atmosphere because the people that you're working with you've now known some of these people on close to 10 years that was almost unheard of to be with the same group of people in the military for 10 years they have the good ups and downs the camaraderie that the military offers i've truly missed that a lot of the friends and acquaintances that I had. Once you leave that environment, you realize, wow, that was something special to have. Don't necessarily get the same camaraderie in the civilian world, so that's a downside. But in the civilian world, you don't have to deploy and go be told where you're going to go on a regular basis. So there's ups and downs. Money's quite a bit better in the civilian world, so yeah, I'm sure that's an important thing. No, thank you for being on the show. I appreciate it. Well, you're certainly welcome. That was fun. Yeah, yeah. We'll have we have. I have so many more ideas. You want to talk conspiracy theories? I got that. <laughs> you want to talk about your Air Force career? I got that. I have a lot of ideas. I thought we were going to talk about bourbon, but oh, we'll you want to you want to we'll insert talk some that the next time. You still got a few minutes. Oh, I do? Well, what yeah. are we going to talk about, bourbon? I don't know. I don't know much about bourbon. I don't drink it. The first time I ever oh. got drunk was wild turkey, <laughs> and I had way too much of that. And ever since, I'm just not really a fan. So, Well, yeah, that's probably not the best way to start. But No. So no. what is bourbon? We... I don't know. To me, I kind of thought it was the same thing as whiskey. I guess what they always say is bourbon, all bourbon is whiskey, but all whiskey is not bourbon that makes any sense Uh so like champagne has Mm -hmm. to be made technically in champagne france right well i didn't know that so bourbon is has to be made in the united states and my understanding that it's has to be made out of 51 percent corn made in the states and it has to be in new oak barrels is where it's aged and it has to be bottled at 80 proof Hmm. so those are the keys that make it bourbon versus whiskey like tennessee whiskey and whatnot so that can be made with wheat versus corn so do other countries sell bourbon and it's an american thing then in other countries if it has to be made here technically they can't although i have had uh, a crown royal that they labeled it as a bourbon mash bill 
So the mash bill is the grains, the corn, the wheat that goes into it. So technically they couldn't call it a bourbon. It was uh, a Canadian whiskey, but it was made out of the same amounts of corn or wheat or whatever. And so they were able to label it. Couldn't be bourbon, but it's a bourbon mash bill. Hmm. So it wasn't as good as yeah. the real thing. Okay. No, I, <laughs> it's not my cup of tea, but... But there's a lot to it. There's, uh, I think the reason I started drinking whiskey is uh, like these people talk about wine and you can taste the berries and you can taste currants and all these different flavors, cinnamon and baking spices. And I'm like, I don't really believe that. So the, sure enough, the same thing with whiskey or bourbon. And, and over time... Maybe I'm tricking myself, but yeah, you can actually pick up some of those nuanced <laughs> flavors. Plus, it's just fun. Maybe you're just drinking a little too much. And, oh, yeah, I can see that. Oh, yeah, I can taste it now. It's just like cinnamon. Don't you have to put it oh, in the wait, sifter glass? Fireball. Yeah. But yeah, that helps. That helps, actually, because it concentrates the the aromas. So that helps huh. the flavor. Huh. What would you say on it's... Christmas? There was something that I, I thought was too strong, and you're like, eh, I don't think it's that strong. I drink straight bourbon or something. Yeah. No, I think that was the the candy cane vodka. Yeah, it was strong by itself. <laughs> well, it was minty. Yeah, it's kind of like rumple. Yeah. Okay. So what, what I know what you talk about? There's a really good bourbon. I think what you said, Virginia, is that the right location, or is it Louisiana or somewhere? There's a certain location that you said has the best bourbon, and it's hard to come by, and you well, can only buy it there. Typically. Kentucky is where most oh. bourbons in the United States are made. It can be made elsewhere in the United States, but most of the best bourbons come from Kentucky. I don't know which one in particular you're talking about. One of the, the hard-to-get ones these days is Buffalo Trace. Everybody, that one, that's what you were talking about. Everybody likes that. So whenever you see a bottle of that, grab it. But apparently they're changing their distributors, I believe. So the thought is there's going to be more of it to be had these days. Have you ever sipped tequila? I'm sure you have, but do you sip tequila like you do bourbon or you just You can. It uh is a very smoky taste, but no, not really. Okay. So bourbon's your favorite, but it's American. It is American. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I wonder if you could bring it to other countries. That's probably a no-go. Oh yeah. They sell bourbon in Europe all the time and whiskey okay. in Europe. Obviously, they're whiskey and yeah. uh, Scotland is probably one of the the best known whiskeys in the world, Scottish whiskey. And that's a very smoky flavor. And then Ireland has the Irish whiskey. That's another very popular. And then, of course, Canadian whiskey. And then in the States, we have Tennessee whiskey and bourbon. So, yeah. And then actually, Japan, they have pretty good whiskeys there as well. Really? So, yeah. Huh. Is Japan traditionally, I know I've seen a bunch of things on Japan being super high tech and all these fancy hotels. Is, hot is Japan just as technologically as advanced as we think it is? Is it just super far in the future while we're really behind? I haven't really been out in the big cities, Tokyo or anything like that. I've been on the outskirts there and obviously the high, their technology is king there. Are they more technologically advanced than we are? I don't know. They have a lot of it. They use a lot of, and they consume a lot of electronics. Yeah, I think they are technically savvy, if that's the question. Yeah. Well, I guess that's all my questions for you. All right. For now, I, like I said, I have a ton. We'll take notes, and we'll do this again. Do you have any more that you'd like to insert about bourbon? I'm surprised you're not drinking it, to be honest, if you wanted to talk about it. <laughs> no, I had to work all day, drinking a lot of water to catch up. So. Oh, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> it's not vodka or anything. Yeah, that's what he says. Is that all you have? Famous that's all last I've got. Words? Yep, so a lot of something about nothing, right? Yeah, nothing about something. Nothing about something. Oh, sorry. The Seinfeld a podcast. Maybe one day Jerry Seinfeld will be on my show. That is my goal. I'm gonna be famous enough for Jerry Seinfeld. He's to... gonna be confused. Something about nothing about something. He's probably gonna be so old by the time <laughs> my podcast actually blows up that he... he's not that old. <laughs> no, I'm just. Kidding. That's all relative. <laughs> Maybe that's what it'll take to get Jerry Seinfeld on my podcast. Is I just Maybe. call him old. And and yeah. then he'll want to come defend himself and jump on my podcast. But yeah, good luck. One you can know, dream, right? No, yeah. One can dream. I'm That's sure you'd I'm... be laughing the whole time, so I don't know if, how you'd be able to ask questions. That would be amazing. Maybe people on TikTok will blow this up one day, and I can get Jerry Seinfeld on the show. So <laughs> Maybe. Come on, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. That is it for Nothing About Something. We're at exactly an hour, so we did All it. All right. Good luck editing, and 
We'll see you next time. All righty. Thank you. And as always, if you enjoyed the show, feel free to rate and subscribe. Rating our podcast and actually following it is really what helps us out in growing and getting Mr. Jerry Seinfeld on the show. Y'all have a great rest of your day. Thank you.